Hi, everyone. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone to the New York City uh, Department of Records Lunch and Learn How Manhattan Cityscape Was Remade After World War II with Samuel Zip. Uh, my name is Yanni Aviles, and I am the Public Programming Officer for the New York City Department of Records and Information Services, aka Doris. Uh, we house New York City's Municipal Archives and Library, and our mission uh, being to foster civic life by preserving and providing access to the historical and contemporary records of New York City governments and its peoples. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today, whom we are all eager to hear from. Uh, Samuel Zip is a cultural and urban historian, author of Manhattan Projects, The Rise and Fall of Urban Renewal in Cold War New York, Oxford 2010, and co-editor of Vital Little Plans, The Short Works of Jane Jacobs, Random House 2016. His most recent book is The Idealist, Wendell Wilkie's Wartime Quest to Build One World, Belknap 2020. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Nation and Plus One, Public Books, The Baffler, and Metropolis, and is professor of American studies and the director of Ur the Ur Urban Studies program at Brown University. Um, cool, so I'm gonna turn it over to Sandy uh, to begin this talk and this presentation. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much. Um, and hello to everybody joining us. I'm so pleased to see so many folks interested uh, to come and uh, hear about this history today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for having me. Particular thanks to Yanni Avilas and Latanya Jones at Doris who've been such a help in getting this set up. And I'm really pleased that there still seems to be interest in this history um, and that people still feel that it is um, an important history to keep alive in our minds uh, today, even uh, more than 10 years after I wrote the book, but these are sort of evergreen sets of topics. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen and we'll get right into it. All right, so what I intend to do today is um, mostly to just give you a sort of visual tour of the book, right? To give you an understanding of what the book um, covers, what it was about, what its main arguments and ideas are, um, and to give you a sense of why you might wanna dive further into it. Um, but what I'm gonna do uh, to do that, um, to begin that is to begin today with a bit of a story, a sort of small slice of New York history, a little noted, long forgotten event, the traces of which I found in a different New York uh, archive, not uh, the New York City Department of Records or the Municipal Archives, which to which I am very indebted for the research for Manhattan Projects. But this piece of forgotten New Yorkiana comes from the archives of the Rockefeller family, just up the Hudson River in Sleepy Hollow. Um, and this curious document is the script of a one act musical comedy uh, that was called A Day at Lincoln Square. And it was written by uh, a real estate agent named Charles Atkinson. And it was performed at a Christmas dinner party in 1958, a party thrown by the real estate form Brazlin Porter and Wheelock, which I think I'll just refer to as BPW from here on out. Um, BPW was the firm that had been hired to manage the relocation of tenants from the site of the Lincoln Square Urban Renewal Project, about which we will talk um, in more detail in a little bit. Um, but what I'd like to do now is to read a bit from the book, a couple pages, about this little bit of um, this little slice of forgotten New York history. Um, and to essentially uh, give you a sense of what this play was about. All right, so let me tell you, uh, I'm gonna sort of just narrate the play for you a little bit here. Uh, the curtain opens on Atkinson, the author, who's playing the narrator, and a three-man chorus who introduces uh, what they call the story. So uh, Atkinson begins, well, what kind of a day has it been? It was a day like any other, he responded, answering his own question. And it was, as the chorus intoned, quote, a day to try the patience of a landlord's soul a day when 10 families stopped doing their washing on the future stage of the Metropolitan Opera, a day when Bach and Beethoven evicted Harvey's bar and grill. It was, the narrator concluded, coming back in, a day when 10 hula hoops circled 64th Street no more, a day in which history was made at Lincoln Square, and you are there, he said, echoing the uh, famous television and radio program that brought listeners into moments in history. So then the chorus begins to actually sing. This was a musical. 
um, delivering the theme in a kind of mocking tone that signaled the shared sense of exasperation that all of these real estate people had with the recalcitrance of tenants to move. And you'll see that this becomes the kind of leitmotif, the overall vision of this play. And they sang, I'm not going to try to sing this. I don't know what the tune was. The music was not supplied. And otherwise, that would otherwise be a, a pretty bad experience for you all, I think. But they said, they sang, it's a terrible, terrible crisis. No one will move uptown. No one will move down. The brokers are charging impossible prices. And some of the tenants are starting to frown. Familiar New York story. Next, quote, a tenant entered singing. I will move anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. If you'll be reasonable, I'm not hard to please. Uh, but then he reeled off a list of places he wouldn't go. Queens is, quote, too aristocratic. The, the Bronx is a zoo. You can't fool me. Kings, meaning Kings County or Brooklyn, of course, are undemocratic. And Jersey is too far under the sea. Besides, Brooklyn is, quote, much like Sir Siberia. It's almost as far away and barren and cold since the Dodgers went west. Right? Remember, this is 1958, a year after the fateful year of 1957. So he sang, he'll move anywhere, 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 as long as anywhere is in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s indeed. My dog has asthma, won't let him climb a stair, he concluded. A home like my old one is just what I need. So then the chorus comes back in, reprising the original theme and following it with a comment that echoed the tenant's complaint. He will move anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. The 50s, the 60s, the 70s indeed. His dog has asthma, won't let him climb a stair. But then they altered the last line to remind themselves who truly had the tenant's best interests at heart. A home like his old one is not what he needs. So this is the overall theme for the play. Um, and then there's a, there's a sort of set of action that happens throughout the play, a very short one act play, right? A, a setting, a brownstone in, on West uh, 64th Street with one character, um, a man they called Esplanado de Santiago, an old man four stories high. Um, and the sort of conflation of the man with building in this is very important, right? There's a, they, they say the action is taking place in an old brownstone four stories high. It really reveals the way the tenants appeared only as a sort of inert feature of the cityscape to these real estate handlers. One more in a series of kind of technical problems to be overcome on the road to demolition and rebuilding at Lincoln Square. So, they go through this whole sort of absurdist dialogue that happens between the character De Santiago and a character who calls himself the BPW blockhead, a name that is both supposed to, uh, to, to signify the way that he is in charge of the block and getting everyone to move, and the way that he carries this out with a sort of dogged determinedness. So there's a bit of self-parody here, but there's also a kind of um, a, a sort of paternalism about the, the people of the um, of, of the neighborhood. Um, they offer De Santiago a place to go. Um, and, and he says, sure, I'll go look at it. And then he comes back and says, oh, it wasn't for me. I don't want to see, I don't want to live in that place. You said, I went to the right place. Where you sent me? Over to the east side near the river. The building is over a hundred years old and there's no one living within a hundred yards of the place. The cops have got it surrounded. And besides, I don't like the name, Gracie Mansion. Right, so there's the punchline delivered. Even the chance to live in the mayor's official residence was not enough to overcome tenant bullheadedness and ignorance in this case. The chorus swept back in to end the play, summing up the triumphant endeavor in which all would share. Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, Fordham University will be built here in many parts, surmounting all adversity. Tenants are much living are living much closer to paradise, theater, symphony, opera, ballet. Millions of lives will be filled with zest and spice, a wonderful sight for us to display. And these dramatic contents were reinforced by the accompanying handmade program, this little piece of ephemera that I discovered in the, the records was just thrown into some box and shipped off to the archives um, more than 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago now which included the script, the score, and a series of cartoonish drawings illustrating the story. Um, there's a sort of awful depiction of De Santiago as a perplexed, disgruntled, and mustachioed man squatting, squatting barefoot inside his own birdcage like a trapped animal or a traveling curiosity, labeled Two Gracie Mansion. Um, and there's an, uh, another sort of set of images, uh, particularly on the title page, this decorated with a ceremonial drawing of a crossed pick and violin, the implements of destruction and rebirth at Lincoln Square, while the cover and closing page would be transformed from 
um, from bitter displaced persons into joyful participants, right? This was the idea that the people of Lincoln Square would become joyful participants in this kind of pageant of urban resurgence. So on the cover, there's a picture of a desultory family of six lined up with packed bags, ready to make way for the opera house and the great open plaza that we're all familiar with of Lincoln Center, sort of sketched in behind them on the, on the, on the, uh, on the program. And by the end of the play, over on the back, uh, the family had themselves become performers in the drama, celebrating their move much closer to paradise, as the uh, as the score put it. The two youngest kids play Romo, Romeo and Juliet. The eldest son bangs on a drum kit. Mother sings an aria. Dad toots on a horn. And the oldest daughter held, holds up a banner wishing Brazlin Porter and Wheelock employees a happy new year. So why notice this little bit of ephemera? Um, why play attention to this bit of light entertainment for an evening dinner gala. I think we immediately recognize its air of haughty disdain, munificent paternalism, and casual racism. But what it can tell us uh, about the subject of my first book, Urban Renewal in Manhattan in the 20 years after World War II, I think goes a bit beyond that. I think it reveals the story the sponsors wanted to tell about urban renewal, about how they wanted to understand it for themselves, how they literally dramatized it for themselves. Um, when all was said and done, the dislocated would actually thank the sponsors and their agents for helping them to play a small part um, in this kind of great drama of civic splendor, national triumph, and urban rejuvenation. It suggests something about the inevitability or the seeming inevitability of urban renewal in the middle of the 1950s, the way that many people seem to think this is just kind of a unfurling of progress with no sense that it needed any kind of contestation or any kind of conflict surrounding it. Um, and how the sort of casual faith in this righteousness uh, might be built out of equal parts of idealism and disdain. And from that, we might get a sense uh, for the, the kinds of ways that it might be um, contested in the years to come. And that's very much the subject of my book, the ways that Manhattan Projects was pitched and also contested in the various spaces of the city uh, where urban renewal landed in the 1950s and up through the 19 or through the mid 1960s. So I'm always interested in these kinds of what seem to be throwaway pieces of ephemera, these little snapshots uh, of forgotten uh, history, for the possibility that they contain these kinds of sort of sedimented, compacted messages about the underlying conflicts that shape history. And that's because I am, as I think Yanni mentioned, not only an urban historian but also a cultural and intellectual historian. I'm fascinated by ideas and stories and about how different people make meaning out of raw experience, and about how those ideas and stories come to have power to shape power struggles, political life, city spaces, and the like. So this interest, incidentally, has shaped the projects I've undertaken since I wrote Manhattan Projects, an edited volume that surveys the whole career of the famed uh, urbanist Jane Jacobs and a narrative history of the idea of one world during World War II. So if anyone's interested in a deep dive into the life and ideas of Jacobs, or an unconventional World War II story about an icon iconoclastic New Yorker, Wendell Wilkie, who traveled around the world and advocated for a progressive form of internationalism in the years leading up to the founding of the United Nations, please do check out my other books. So I am fascinated by the way that cities have been shaped physically, but also the way they've been imagined. I'm always interested in the ways that cities um, uh, the sort of intellectual and symbolic dimensions of city life, the visions and conflicts that have sh shaped and spurred urban history. I'm interested in the visions of city life that produce a map like this one, say, um, a 1940 map produced by the City Planning Commission with sections containing areas for, quote, clearance, replanning, and low rent housing, or a demonstration like this one, right? Um, from earlier, I think, a little bit in the mid 1930s. Um, a tenant demonstration um, also calling for the transformation of the uh, New York City cityscape, right? Products of the slums, horse and buggy days are gone, slums must go too, right? We often see these as, in some ways, um, visions of the city from different perspectives, from different places in the political and social spectrum, from above and from below. But one of the fascinating things about the history of urban renewal is how at the beginning of its history, in the 40s and up into the early 1950s, uh, some of these groups uh, found themselves on the same side of the barricades surrounding this. And the story of their separation, the story of the way they found come, came to find themselves in conflict, uh, is one of the big stories of 
of Manhattan Project. Each of these uh, little little vignettes, these images, these maps, right? This story, uh, this uh, one act play, each of them reveals this kind of overlapping, but also conflicting, conflicting aspects of what we might call the structure of feeling that underpinned the experience of urban renewal. Each of them shows how, uh, something about why people would engage in a huge long-term campaign to tear down huge swaths of the city at mid-century. And crucially, what the price of that campaign might be. And we see that if we look at them from the right angle or understand their context or the unpredictable effects of their impact or the way that people moved and changed the way they saw uh, the cityscape as this history unfolded. This is, I think, what drew me to a topic like urban renewal in New York, but led me uh, to try to put some fresh light on a topic that's, uh, I think, been much studied over the years um, or much sort of digested. It's particularly when I began this project quite a few years ago now, uh, around the turn of the 20th century in 2000 to 2002 or three, when I first began uh, shaping the, what would become my dissertation and then eventually this book, um, we really understood at that point uh, urban rural renewal very much as a policy, right? And when it had been studied up till then and still often today, we see it as a, as, as a part of the history of, of urban policy in the city and in the world. Of the country and the world, right? When, so when I talk about urban renewal, I mean a very specific thing in this case, uh, the campaigns to remake cities that were authorized and funded by the United States Housing Act of 1949, um, a, a national uh, a national bill, uh, sort of legacy of the New Deal and, and Harry Truman's Fair Deal uh, that looked to bring federal dollars to campaigns to build more uh, subsidized housing and also to uh, give... Um, to give cities uh, the wherewithal to take on what were thought of as slum uh, clearance programs. Um, and although, as we'll see, the places I've chosen to tell the story of urban renewal are not all places made or unmade by that policy alone, but it's the, it's the policy at the heart of the, the moment that I think of as the, the origins of the vision of urban renewal, although we tend to use that term in lots of different ways uh, down, we've tended to use it in that lots of different ways down through the years. So we can trace that history as a story of political decisions and urban policies, right? How urban renewal was essentially an attempt to solve fiscal and economic problems for cities in the aftermath of World War II. Looking at it this way, urban renewal was essentially an attempt to head off suburbanization and attract capital back to central cities by giving the federal government, as I said, the fiscal wherewithal to attract private developers who wanted to undertake redevelopment projects in cities. Many are, of us are, of course, familiar with the results of these policies. It's become uh, kind of common sense, conventional wisdom in our story of New York and other cities in the years after World War II. These policies were uh, bulldozed the old 19th century city to clear away what they thought of as slums or blight, quote unquote, and replaced it with new modern cityscapes influenced by what was then the state of the art in modern architectural and urban planning theory, super block plans dotted with austere modern buildings, the so-called towers in the park ideal uh, of modern urban planning. So my book deals with many of those details, many of which are fascinating and looks at them in depth and the way they evolved in the cityscape of New York City, and uh, maybe even puts back some sort of local detail into that history in New York. Uh, New York has a special place to play in that history, and I encourage you to check out those parts of the book. But urban renewal, I think, has attracted so much attention, I think, because it was much more than a policy. It was a kind of vision of how cities could be rescued, a vision that sparked a series of conflicts and struggles over how Americans would live in cities and how they thought they should live in cities. These were political conflicts, of course, but they were also cultural struggles in the sense that they were struggles over the meaning of city life. A great deal of the source of these struggles of meaning resulted from conflict over what the impact of modern planning and architecture truly was, and how should we we should see that that conflict across the course of the 1950s in New York and other cities? Uh, people asked themselves whether these massive transformations were fulfilling their promise. Were they truly development? Were they truly progress? Or were they destruction? Were they markers of loss? Um, supporters of urban renewal had both idealistic and pragmatic goals. They hoped to make urban property profitable again in a time, as I said, of suburbanization and bring the white middle class back downtown. But they also wanted to rehouse uh, people who lived in, uh, people like the folks in these picture, picture people who lived in crowded, uh, overcrowded tenement uh, neighborhoods, right? So-called slum dwellers to rationalize and order a chaotic unplanned city. And particularly in Manhattan, they wanted to supply the city with a modern built environment equal to what they saw as New York's role as capital of the world in the post-war era. And this is a major theme 
in my book is looking at the way that people from all across the political spectrum imagined and assumed that New York would be seen as the kind of, of capital of the world um, and would uh, need a built environment to live up to that reputation. So Manhattan's urban renewal boosters hoped that urban renewal would help project an image of modernization and prosperity that would compete with and surpass the equally grandiose visions of progress on offer in the Soviet Union. Thus the Cold War subtext in my subtitle. And that's something that I won't go into a lot of detail today, um, but that pops up again and again. There's a, there's a way that urban renewal is part of what we might think of as the domestic front of the Cold War um, and deployed as a way to offset the threat from the Soviet Union, this kind of cultural side of the Cold War. Um, also in the way that it, it imagines itself as a, a, a beacon, the United States imagines itself as a beacon to the, so the quote unquote third world, which is supposedly uh, sort of choosing between the, um, uh, as it goes through decolonization, choosing supposedly between the West and the East, between the Soviets and the US. That's of course a much more complicated history um, and many of those folks were choosing a third path. Um, but this is very much the subtext under which uh, much of this is unfolding, particularly, again, in New York because of its uh, imagination of itself as uh, at the height of post-war culture. Now, opponents, on the other hand, saw urban renewal as a symbol of far less promising and grand developments. It literally, for them, meant the destruction and loss of numerous working-class neighborhoods. It perpetuated the deindustrialization that was eroding working-class livelihoods, and it fostered increased racial segregation. We're quite familiar with this verdict on the history of urban renewal now, and many people pointed it out as it was happening. And again, my book um, tells the story of many of those folks and their, um, in, in real time, the way they began to articulate these critiques. But urban renewal's opponents also saw the effects of its plans as an absolutist, overwhelming imposition on older patterns of city life. What was modern, clean, and rational for urban renewal's backers was alienating and regimented for them. Many of them thought it had a social and aesthetic impact more suited to a totalitarian regime rather than the United States. They too saw these projects in, li in light of images and ideas motivated by the Cold War conflict with the Soviet Union. So there's a sort of double-sided uh, aspect in which this becomes a front in the Cold War. So. Uh, Manhattan Project is concerned with the way that urban renewal formed as a vision of remaking cities, how it was put into practice in actual places in the Manhattan cityscape, and then how it was undone by the counter visions of those who lived in the places that urban renewal left in its wake. So part of the idea here was uh, is to get us beyond the usual Moses, Moses versus Jacob story. I think I thought 20 years ago that was necessary, and it seems that that story is um, completely uh, constant, always with us, always renewable. Um, and so we still need, I think, to, um, to kind of supply ourselves with newer and more interesting stories, I think, about the showdown between these two giants and the ways they stand in for two visions. Um, I'm not saying that story is wrong necessarily, but um, this book attempted uh, to reveal some new stories of how urban renewal was created, how it was critiqued, and some of the other things that were going on in these years, and some of the things that influenced both Moses and Jacobs. They are both, of course, major characters in the book. To do this, I look at four case studies, exemplary projects that provide a glimpse into how urban renewal was made and unmade. Some of these places won't be found on the map, so to speak, of official urban renewal areas. I've been most concerned to show how the, the vision underpinning urban renewal and the way that it was contested and those these linked developments got underway even before urban renewal had been codified in the 1949 Housing Act. So what I'll do now is give you a quick visual tour of these sites um, and we'll land on the fourth Lincoln Center that we talked about a little bit and spend a little bit more time at Lincoln Square. So for me, one very important place to begin is with the United Nations headquarters um, here on Turtle Bay. Right, it's the first. Um, here it is uh, going up on Turtle Bay in the late 1940s. Um, it's the first. We think of the the UN headquarters building as the first of the international style glass skinned skyscrapers. Um, that's really the way it's entered the lore of um, architectural history and in some ways urban history too. But I am interested in seeing it also as another kind of first. Uh, it's in many ways the model for a new mode of urban planning, a new vision for urban planning um, at uh, in New York City. Um, an image, a vision of urban planning that would replace the old 19th century cityscape, in this case at Turtle Bay, there in this aerial view, um, 
with uh, all its supposedly outmoded and undesirable issue, uh, uses, like the slaughterhouses that still stood there up to World War II, where, as this article in uh, a UN publication tells us, the sheep were led to uh, the slaughter by a goat named Judas, right? Another one of these great little stories. Um, uh, in fact, right, where this vision sought to implant a whole new spatial model of urban life in the Manhattan cityscape. This is a New York City publication showing how they imagined that um, a new vision of the city could just snap right into place uh, in and amongst the old and displace a version, uh, some swath of the old, right? Uh, one that would feature open spaces, green spaces, modern and avant-garde forms of European urbanism, right? Some of these images, this one and the one two previous were, are taken by the famous modernist uh, urban uh, architecture photographer, Ezra Stoller. And these are these images that really showed what would, uh, what the kind of city that would displace the old city. Um, this was a vision uh, that would transform New York City. And this is a, this is actually a rendering by the other great, uh, one of the other great modernists, the or it was similar to an image, it's actually by Earl Purdy, but it's similar to an image, uh, other images uh, that were directed by Hugh Ferris, a number, another of the other great uh, envisioners of modernist New York, right? A vision that would transform New York City, hopefully as in this perspective rendering of the impact of the UN into a city that symbolized the UN's linked goals, right? World peace and a transformed urban environment that would confirm New York status as the capital of the world that it claimed for itself in these years. Those of us familiar with the east side of New York will, re will recognize that this is not what got built, but it was the vision, right, for what uh, the UN would unleash on the east side, right, would, would uh, allow for the city to imagine itself as, as remade in a new cityscape. Then, um, this story continues uh, just down the East River at our, my second site, um, Stuyvesant Town, right, MetLife's a uh, massive middle-income development that was just as, if not more important, in reshaping the actual lived experience of um, New York City and Manhattan life in the late 1940s, of showing what um, the idea of urban renewal, the idea of transforming the cityscape could do uh, for everyday life in the city, uh, in, in the city of Manhattan. Um, it had a similar mission, right, to clear away a so-called, quote-unquote, slums and blight, in this case, the gas house district, 18 blocks of working class apartments and businesses between 23rd and 14th Street West of First Avenue. And here are some um, images, a couple images I'll show here from the archive of images that uh, MetLife created in 1945, just before it sponsored the, the demolition of this entire neighborhood, a quite um, amazing archive uh, of, an, of a lost neighborhood. Um, this was a neighborhood that was, as this image demonstrates, um, hard by the Manhattan uh, Midtown Office District and not far from MetLife's own headquarters at Madison Square. Um, it was demolished in 1945 and replaced, as we know, um, from by a so-called uh, suburb in the city. That's what MetLife advertised um, Stuyvesant Town as, which, uh, like the UN, was influenced by modern planning and urbanism with its green swards and towers and the park. Um, although there's an um, in-depth story in the book about the actual, uh, the, the complex influences between European and American urbanism that creates the vision of Stuyvesant Town. Um, there was con controversy, however, about uh, its urban design and its impact on the city. This is an image uh, created by the Citizens Hous Housing Council, a mid-century and still active um, advocacy group that protested the plans for Stuyvesant Town on a number of different grounds, um, on the idea that it was a kind of walled town, um, uh, fencing out the rest of the Lower East Side, that it um, had no schools in it, um, that it uh, had no playground or park, which in the end didn't end up being true, um, that it would be hard to navigate, and that it would block uh, the views of its neighbors. Uh, but the most important thing that uh, it protested, which was taken up by many other activists during this period, many other organizers, was about uh, segregation. Um, and a group of New York City civil rights activists uh, from Harlem and from inside the project itself, white activists inside the project, uh, combining with black activists from the long-term uh, civil rights uh, uh, campaigns in the city successfully campaigned to open the project to African American tenants um, across the 1950s. So uh, I tell the whole story of that and its relationship to the changing political culture of, of New York City in, in the post-war era. 
Um, still, I think even in these years, as this fight was going on, and some reason the, the reason that that people joined so eagerly in this fight was because Stuyvesant Town was seen as representative of a kind of possible democratic spirit. If it could be desegregated, they would the people hoped it would actually live up to its uh, vision of of um, a kind of democratic space uh, in the cityscape despite the fact that nobody at this time was thinking about the clearance of the gas house district as a very undemocratic kind of act. That would come later. Um, so uh, uh, when Stuyvesant Town debuted in the late 1940s and into the early 50s, people worked to make a middle-class life in this mass housing complex. And they were helped by the post-war consumer economy. And this is a story I tell in the book too. This ad from an old uh, department store, Ludwig Bauman, one of the many department stores, as we, many some of us may remember, that used to populate Manhattan, um, featured Stuyvesant Town alongside public housing. Uh, some of those uh, projects listed there in the middle are public housing projects. Um, along with some of the new um, privately supported projects that would become the kind of uh, blueprints for urban renewal. And it saw them as all part of the same post-war economy, the same, same post-war mass economy, right? And this ad shows how much Stuyvesant Town figured as an in-town complement to the suburbs of the post-war era. Here's another ad from Hearns, another one of those um, department stores, a local one right on 14th Street at Fifth Avenue, uh, that deeply uh, invested in, 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 in advertising Stuyvesant Town apartments and showing them as, um, as connected to the cityscape and as part of the cityscape. It even made it all the way uh, to the pages of House and Garden, um, a kind of very up, you know, upper, uh, upscale, excuse me, um, post-war design and house magazine, as I think we, um, we're all familiar with, where it shows how a family attempts to make a middle-class life in a standard apartment in the maze of Stuyvesant Town. And so I think these images reveal the conflict between anonymity and newness, regimentation and hope that Stuyvesant Town exemplified and a paradox that was uh, to become symbolic uh, of the whole experience of urban renewal as it unfurled across the city in the 1940s, uh, 1950s and into the 1960s. Um, and so the third uh, place that I explore this uh, set of problems is in East Harlem. Uh, the third site is the, uh, in the book is East Harlem and its, um, its redevelopment with public housing. It's the neighborhood in Manhattan that was the most um, transformed by the uh, uh, boom in public housing that, uh, that New York City Housing Authority undertook in the late 1940s and into the 1950s and up into the early 1960s, right? The great uh, post-war building boom uh, that transformed the cityscape um, and in many ways for the better, supplying uh, a whole strata of affordable housing that the city would be much poorer without. Um, but East Harlem was a place where uh, a lot of this got built and in a very short time and in close proximity to one another, this map. Um, shows the planned redevelopment of the Harlem area, showing a number of the different, some of the uh, projects that would come in in those years, and some of them that um, would come later are not on this map. This is a late 40s map. Um, some images here of, of the city of, of East Harlem as it is under um, construction for this uh, transformation. This is a panorama of East Harlem in the early 1960s from the vantage point of 106th and Park, roughly, I think, hovering a little bit over the um, tracks of the, uh, of the railroad there. Uh, we see uh, projects like Franklin Plaza on the left, um, the East River houses off in the distance, uh, the George Washington houses, um, and then clearance for uh, the DeWitt Clinton houses are in the foreground there until a little bit to the right. Um, other projects like the James Weldon Johnson houses and uh, perhaps the largest one in the neighborhood, the George Washington houses. Um, now, at first, this influx of public housing was welcomed in the neighborhood. It was a needed new affordable housing, as uh, to use the language that we use these days. Um, but by the late 1950s, and early 1960s, it had also become something of a burden, or some people felt that it had become a kind of burden on the neighborhood. New public housing was overwhelming the neighborhood, some constituencies thought, turning it from a kind of mixed-use neighborhood into a low-income monoculture, weeding out neighborhood businesses, reinforcing racial segregation, uprooting lives, and creating what some thought of as an anonymous and alienating cityscape. So a group of social workers, and this is one of the stories that the, the book tells, um, who were themselves supporters of public housing and had worked to uh, attract NYCHA's 
um, redevelopments to the city, uh, to their neighborhood in the, in, the, in the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s, um, they began to work with residents of the neighborhood and of the new public housing landscape that was going up in the 1950s, um, and a, a series of outside advisors, in particular Jane Jacobs, this is where one of the places she got her start in thinking about cities long before the fame of death and life of great American cities, or five to ten years before, um, to try to imagine new forms for public housing. They didn't want to reject public housing, um, but they wanted to try to think about how they might transform the landscape of public housing to make it uh, less alienating, less rigid, less um, overwhelming. Right. So one of the first places they tried to do this was with the uh, early plans for the aforementioned DeWitt Clinton houses. Right, We saw the clearance for it in that earlier image, um, and they tried to come up with a new vision for how one might plan these vision, these kinds of projects. This is their plan. This was uh, done with Jane Jacobs's input and a number of other urbanists. Uh, the architects Perkins and Will created the drawings. Um, a, a sort of well-known modernist architecture firm uh, that had uh, offices around the country and particularly in New York in these years. Um, and they hoped to, to try to envision a new kind of landscape for projects with low-rise um, buildings rather than just high-rise buildings um, and a series of inter smaller interventions you can see there in the fringes around the large, the, the middle drawing, uh, uh, visions of how uh, to mimic rather than abjure the traditional streetscape of the city outside. Now, this uh, image actually uh, violated all kinds of housing codes, public housing regulations, and so it was never built. Um, and, and this is how DeWitt Clinton Houses was actually built in a series of, um, of different places. But you can notice there is a little bit of a change with DeWitt Clinton, right? Um, it's on a f uh, less a a of a kind of monoculture super block, right? Uh, more streets are allowed to to blend through. Not all of the old cityscape is knocked down, right? It works its way in in certain places around the older cityscape. Um, and so you see the beginnings of a transformation in the thinking. Um, it's happening both uh, at the official level in New York City housing, but also at the, at the level of the, 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 the neighborhood itself um, and the people living there who are beginning to demand a different kind of urban form. So this inspires a number of efforts uh, amongst um, community residents and social workers in that area to rethink the impact of conventional planning. Um, for instance, the East Harlem Plaza at the Jefferson Houses, which was a kind of um, community performance space and play space that was set up in the middle of the projects, or at a more lively, more um, articulated, more uh, more kind of um, nuanced kind of space. Right. This is a, a flyer from a from an event that took place there in the early 1960s. Um, and then also, uh, perhaps most profoundly, was the redesign of the Franklin House. Uh, sorry, the Franklin Plaza. Um, open space redesigns, which were taken on by a modernist architect by the name of Albert Meyer, who came in to work um, with the, the, the community there. Um, and these projects, these uh, proposals attempted to knit the projects, the, knit the buildings back into the street with, a, with a, a lot of attention to how one might plan those um, grounds, and I go into a lot more detail on this in the book, as a series of little articulated related spaces rather than just open space and green space, right? So the vision is to knit these places back into the street, to see them um, rather than from a sort of uh, top-down uh, kind of um, open space view of just grass and sun as the uh, as the amenities of these kinds of places, um, as to, to try to restore an older form of human-scaled urbanism. Um, however, this comes with a kind of a price, too. The social workers reimagined the neighborhood, um, not just intricately, but also as a kind of, in, in a sort of PR way, um, as what they called uh, the new Upper East Side, uh, an attempt to join up East Harlem and the old Silk Stocking District, which tended to erase or override the histories and struggles of the em emerging Puerto Rican community in what was coming in those years to be known as El Barrio, um, then it was really just emerging in the early 1960s when this image that you see here was made as a way to try to attract people to, to live in Franklin Plaza, which had started off as a New York City Housing Authority public project, but had been taken over by a cooperative and made into a middle income um, housing cooperative, which still is today, as far as I know, I think um, ha that hasn't changed in the last few years. Um, and they were attempting quite, quite, uh, um, quite overtly to attract white families to this 
um, to this project, and they were advertising it as essentially a, a part of East Harlem Plaza. This was as a part of the Upper East Side, excuse me. This was largely because people in the neighborhood said the, the neighborhood was no longer um, as integrated as it had once been, right? It once kind of this, particularly this part of East Harlem, um, in the 106th Street and up to 110th, 112th Street had been a kind of uneasy but um, kind of mate meeting ground between uh, Puerto Rican, Black, and Italian neighborhoods. Uh, and, and East Harlem was actually, um, in many ways, uh, the the development of public housing in East Harlem was was uh, was leading to further white flight in the neighborhood. And so they were trying to offset that, but in a way they were also uh, it was a kind of heavy handed re branding of the community in a way that overrode an emerging identity as a Puerto Rican neighborhood. So one of the interesting things about looking at this is that there are interesting developments um, in rethinking urban renewal and also some of the beginnings of, an, of, of a later history that we might think of as a sim as simply gentrification of the neighborhood, um, although that uh, is really a long ways in the offing in these years. Um, so I, I still think uh, that these ideas would have an important role to play in the efforts to undo the sway of urban renewal ideas over modern urbanism. And that's a story that we can see when we turn to the most important uh, project of that era. And that's the uh, Lincoln Square Urban Renewal Area and its centerpiece, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. In some ways, Lincoln Center was the quintessential Manhattan project, the most exalted and representative urban renewal site in the program's early history. It was to be a project of great national and international significance, the fulfillment of the campaign of urban rebirth and international visibility launched with the United Nations arrival a decade earlier. It would use the power of high culture, the performing arts, to rescue the city and confirm New York's status as the so-called capital of the world. And it gets caught up in all kinds of things in these years, right? This is an image from West Side Story that many will be familiar with, right? Which was shot in part on the ground, on, on the area that um, that was being cleared for New York for uh, for Lincoln Center. Um, this shows this uh, that kind of mixed. Uh, exultation and destruction at the heart of what urban renewal was trying to do. Another one of these kind of uh, images that I'm quite interested in. Um, and But it was really sold as a vision of transforming the cityscape, right? Here are the modern architects who planned the buildings of Lincoln Center, a sort of who's who of the modernist uh, establishment, emerging establishment in those years, fronted by the money man in the front there, John D. Rockefeller III. Um, and some of the performers, um, you'll see Leonard Bernstein over there to uh, to, to the right, um, posing with some of the early models in front of the, the tenement landscape that was to go. Um, so by the mid 50s, when this project got underway, this triumphal endeavor had acquired a more strategic mission as well that I already mentioned. All right, Lincoln Center was called on to provide a symbol of national cultural maturity and urban resurgence brandishable in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. So here's Eisenhower at the groundbreaking with Rockefeller on the left, um, Mayor Wagner on the right. You can't see Robert Moses, but he's there. Um, it's Hulan Jack in the back, the uh, Manhattan Bureau president on the right. So in a time when both urban renewal and the performing arts were envisioned as resources for shore shoring up the nation's internal cultural defenses, Lincoln Center brought these kind of two cultural and two missions, cultural and urban together in one literally shining symbol and gave them a sort of concrete uh, form in the cityscape. Um, so the, the, the city's boosters said that it would prove that Americans living in the so-called affluent society valued spiritual as much as material goods. They sought to symbolize these linked missions by providing Lincoln Center with this setting on par with the classical European models of urban planning, like a Ve Venetian piazza was often the model imagined for, for Lincoln Center, right? This is another image by Hugh Ferris, the great modernist uh, in, uh, vision maker for, for, for New York and other cities. So Lincoln Center offered what Rockefeller called a new kind of city therapy that made culture and the arts the cornerstone of modernist superblock and open space urban renewal efforts. With that vision, though, came a rather less exalted perspective on the people who already lived in the neighborhood. In the city's plans, the people of the neighborhood were, at, were often afterthoughts, incidental to the visual and statistical impression of decay and decline on display in the careful plans that Robert Moses um, drew up uh, to, to advertise and to uh, to plan this, right? There was physical deterioration in the neighborhood for sure. That's not uh, that's not in doubt. Most of the row houses dated to the 19th century. Many were run down, and residents had long found it hard to get loans for improvements. Right? It was essentially a redlined neighborhood. Um, 
But the truth about the neighborhood itself, its people, its institutions, the way people made lives there was considerably more complicated. Uh, the project sponsors tried to treat residents and business people fairly in the way that they carried out their relocations. Um, but as the BPW pageant that we started with revealed, they regarded them as largely impediments in the way of a greater future and encouraged them to see themselves as playing sort of a functional role in the arrival of a brave new world. They would play a small part in a great drama of civic splendor, national triumph and urban rejuvenation. And rather than being what they were, actors on their own terms, um, in, in a neighborhood drama of their own making. The residents, of course, didn't see it this way. Uh, this was a polyglot, polyglot urban neighborhood, typical for Manhattan of its era, working in lower middle class. The residents were largely native-born Americans of immigrant descent who traced their origins to a huge diversity of European countries. The largest and fastest growing minority in the neighborhood was the Puerto Rican population, which stood around a quarter of the total in the early to mid-1950s. So um, in response to these plans, which were announced in 1955, the neighborhood groups organized two committees, one made up of residents, one made up of businesses to try and stop their project, stop the project. Uh, their testimony came before the city planning commission in 1957, reveals their very different understandings of the nature of the neighborhood. Here's a flyer for that, um, that event. And here are some related picketing, right? Shelter before culture. This is one of the major themes that emerges from their testimony is a conception of their lives and homes as an alternative form of culture, one that Lincoln Center's vision imperiled. As one resident put it, what about our homes? Aren't our homes beauty and culture? But it was also not just private life that was imperiled. There was a public dimension as well. At Lincoln Center, public and private were yoked together by the commercial life of the community. And I wanted to just quickly zoom in on this, and I'll close with this uh, in the next minute or two here, um, to show you what Lincoln Center looked like um, and how it transformed over these years. So here's Link what Lincoln Center looked like in plan before the urban renewal project went through. And what we're going to do is zoom in on some of the places of business in, um, in this uh, part of the city. There's a staggering variety that's unusual even uh, for Manhattan today where chain and big box stores, as we all know, moved in in the late 20th century um, and where most industry had been banished to the boroughs by that same time too. But in the late 1950s, Lincoln uh, Square was a thriving mixed use neighborhood. A roll call of the various establishments will give you an idea of this. Here they are in uh, just a list drawn from one of the lists. I just wanted to sort of give you a sense of it. We won't go into too much detail, but you can see the kind of variety, right? You can also shape this as a kind of word cloud to show which were the most uh, prominent in the, in the cityscape in those years. Um, and you can see the, the the basic stuff pops out, but there's a lot of different little interesting things that were that were, were happening in the cityscape of 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 um, Lincoln Square. I'm going to go. I, I'll go into much more detail on this in a piece that's going to be released on Lincoln Square uh, Lincoln Center's website in the next few weeks um, called "Seeing Lincoln Square," and I hope people will have a look at that. Um, if we zoom in even further uh, to one block in the area where Lincoln Center would arrive, we can look at just more detail on this. I'm um, gonna get a sense for it very quickly. So are all the businesses on that block. This is the different uh, uh, parts of the economy that they were in. And here's how the, all those types were dispersed on the map. Um, you can get a sense for all the different um, kinds of, 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 of images in, in uh, excuse me, different kinds of um, businesses there in, in the city in that point. Um, so this gives you one measure of what was lost when we went from this part of the city to this, right? This kind of transformation of the cityscape. The residents, or at least one in particular, had a name for what was lost. This is Abraham Halleckman. He owned an auto parts store in Lincoln Square. He's here, he is protesting at City Hall in 1957. He's protesting what he called goodwill. He's protesting how businesses that operated on slim margins and didn't have capital, like the great institutions of Lincoln Center, who could bet on high culture and modernism as modes of city making, how they were invested in the relations of goodwill they could establish between neighbors. This is expressed here in an economic to term, denoting the intangible asset arising from the relationship a business has with its customers. That's goodwill. So Halleckman is telling us that he's not the only investor in his threatened business. To get the full measure of his loss, one would need to account for the interconnected relations of affiliation between customer and proprietor. He was invested in this neighborhood, um, and his neighborhoods were invested in neighbors were invested in him. The goodwill of his neighbors, built up painstakingly over the decades, made the business val valuable. 
So this is him just not sitting in for himself, but for the relations of exchange and connection that his business represented. The loss was not only of a self, but of, but of a whole urban world. So this notion that their neighborhood embodied a dynamic form of everyday culture based on an economy of goodwill is quite distinct from that on offer in the vision of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and that on offer in the Brazelin Porter and Wheelock play that we began with. So this vision wasn't immediately successful. It failed to stop urban renewal at Lincoln Square. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think in many ways, Lincoln Center has become part of city life, established its own form of goodwill in some ways. But when the movement at Lincoln Sweat Center combined, or Lincoln Square, combined with the rethinkings of modernist orthodoxy Doxy like those undertaken by the East Harlem social workers, it nonetheless laid the groundwork for a movement to unmake urban renewal, one that would take shape later on in the 1960s and reorient, reorient urban planning and city rebuilding away from modern planning ideals. So it's those lost stories, those evidence of those almost forgotten struggles that give us a window onto the early days of this history, the history of how urban renewal was made and unmade in Manhattan in the years after World War II. So it's a story of triumph and tragedy, of building and displacement. It's the story of how the city of towers and ghettos of the late 20th century was made, a city that across the last half of the 20th century was simultaneously arising to become a great world city and falling eventually into what the so-called urban crisis of the 1960s and 70s. In some ways, it's the city of, of how New York, New York City was becoming the city we came to know at the end of the 20th century, in many ways, the city that we're still coming to grips with in the early 20th century as well. So I hope that was a useful tour of Manhattan projects. Thanks. Hi everyone. Thanks so much. That was amazing. And there are so many questions. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all of them, but what I'm going to do is uh, paste in the chat uh, Sandy's email. So any unanswered questions, you can just email him directly or any questions for us, we'll review them and try and get back to you. Um, and so right now, you know, everyone's muted and the mics are off, but we've been compiling the questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Latanya to read some of the questions uh, that you all posted to Sandy um, and then they can just respond. Um, thanks so much, that was like amazing. I have millions of questions for you, but we are short on time. So go for it, LaTanya. We'll move through as many as we can. Uh, one of the earlier questions uh, was about the uh, piece you were reading from about the musical and if you could show the cover of uh, what you were reading from. If possible, I, unfortunately, I can't. I have a. I had a really bad copy of it, um, and it's not. It's not really. I never. I never really digitized it or anything. It's not in the book. It's, yeah, it's. I just never. I never had a really great copy of it. it it'd, okay. uh, it'd be nice if the archive would put that up somewhere. Pretty interesting. Okay. So the next question is: Were any urban renewal plans, policies, procedures, or principles informed in any way by World War II? Um, or by what, uh, I guess, by the World War II necessitated a rebuilding, restoration of European cities, or do you believe the American experience was uniquely independent? Yeah, I, I think the U.S. experience is different. Um, I think there's a kind of ambient spirit about in those days, in the immediate post-war era, that, um, that the bombing of, of European cities um, has a sort of revealed uh, an opportunity, a grim opportunity to transform the way people lived and that, that American urbanists are looking to that. But I think it's in some ways a minor chord in a larger and a longer story that goes back to the war, before the war um, to longer traditions of thinking about how to transform urban life and particularly the longer history of quote unquote slum clearance. Um, and what I call an ethic of city rebuilding. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time in the early part of the book tra uh, tracing out that longer history. Um, so yeah, I, I think World War II plays a role in that it opens up the ground and it transforms the political culture and it gives people, particularly um, urbanists in cities across the country, a moment to think about what they might do once the uh, armistice comes. Um, and a lot of the planning, for instance, for Stuyvesantown happens during the war, um, but, uh, I think that that vision that uh, happens in Europe where uh, there's a kind of concerted vision of, of replanning because of the bombing is not quite as um, explicit. Although images like I showed of, of the gas house district, um, people often compared those to the images of the bombing. 
of, of Europe and the remains of, of European cities. Okay, um, can you talk more about the connections between design ideas of modernism and notions of progress uh, with that of cultural erasure and often, if not always, displacement of BIPOC, working class or low income peoples? Yeah, yeah, I think you said cultural erasure, that was the phrase. Is that right, Latanya? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the stories that I attempted to tell in this book was, was some of the actually idealistic origins of the vision that, um, that uh, takes shape as urban renewal eventually. Um, one of the interesting things about the way that urban renewal plays out is there are plenty of what we would today think of as uh, communities of color that advocated for urban renewal in those years. Um, it was only over time as the, as the policies played out and as some of the longstanding um, uh, kind of assumptions and uh, visions of white supremacy that lay at the heart of both um, of sort of city remaking ideals kind of took hold, right, that many communities started to think of, um, as James Baldwin famously called urban renewal in the early 60s, um, uh, Negro removal, right, this kind of vision, which uh, was not uh, necessarily on people's minds uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the vision. There were there were some people who uh, worried about this at the beginning, um, but there were also uh, uh, organizations, particularly in the civil rights movement, who were and in the tenant movement who backed these visions. So um, that is, in, in some ways, what my book hoped to do was to tell the story of the way that. Um, that way that common sense transformed across this period. Um, this is in some sense the history of, of the making of how people came to see it as that more so than they did as a kind of assumed vision for um, transforming, uh, for, for beneficently transforming cityscapes, right? And I think that was what I was trying to get at with the uh, Brazen Porter and Wheelock play, the way that uh, both of those elements are there in the play um, and it's just about how people begin to see it, how, how one vision unravels and another takes shape across this, this period. Um, I think there's more to say about that. Um, and, uh, but I was concerned in this to, to understand how that, um, how that vision emerges, how that vision of these as essentially projects of, um, uh, of, of removal and erasure, how that vision comes about and how people at the time began to understand it that way and how that common sense took shape. Okay, uh, we have a question. In what way was the housing code violated with the plans for the Dewey Clinton houses? Oh gosh, details. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it had to do with, um, something to do with the way that the, the, um, the way that the low, the lower um, buildings didn't allow enough light and air in, and that's the the public it was the it wasn't it wasn't city building codes which were in some sense being transformed in these years by these new kinds of modernist designs, but it had to do with the way that the public housing um, the NYCHA codes uh, required certain amounts of um, coverage and light and air. Uh, in their calculations to be let into apartments. And I think this perhaps violated that in some way. I am forgetting those details, but if you're quite interested um, in those specifics, please do email me and I'll look it up. Okay, uh, I think this will probably be our last question, but um, where can undergraduates studying urban planning see more of these architectural records and urban planning promotional records apart from Doris? Do you have mm -hmm. any favorite archives that may be lesser known? Um, someone else commented that the Puerto Rican Institute at Hunter College might have some interesting records. Yeah, Hunter has to share. Yeah, Hunter has some really fascinating stuff, particularly um, about the ways that Puerto Rican um, neighborhood groups uh, began to displace those groups of social workers that I talked about, as El Barrio really takes over from East Harlem as the kind of imagination of of of, of that part of the city. Um, and yeah, some of the the community groups there um, are, are well represented at, at Hunter. Um, you know, there's a, doing a project like this requires one to sort of jump around and find things all across the city in different places. Um, the Avery Library at Columbia University has a really good collection of um, of records. Some of the uh, records um, that um, that allowed me to understand the uh, organizations that contested urban renewal on, on both its uh, on on the grounds of its its racism and its segregation on a, and also on the grounds of its sort of displacing cultural life at Lincoln Square all come from documents that I found at Avery. Um, again, the 
this, the Rockefeller archives, which are not easy to use because they're not easy to get to. Um, but that's the one that jumps into my head. The other, oh, the other great one, of course, is the um, is uh, at the at LaGuardia Community College in Queens, where the New York City Housing Authority archives are, which is a great resource for students um, of, of New York history to find out more about um, these this era of urban planning transformation. Great. Um, so we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but I pasted in the chat um, Sandy's email address so you can email him directly. Um, I also placed in the chat just some links to Doris's uh, websites and our social media channels. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining. This was like an amazing talk, very timely always. Um, Thanks to Sandy, thanks to uh, the Department of Records for hosting this event. Um, so yeah, please check the chat uh, for any contact info and to just connect with everyone. So thanks uh, for coming today. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate the chance to do this and, and for your interest in my book. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.